Get this and get it straight. Crime is a sucker's road, and those who travel it wind up in the gutter of the prison of the grave. This time it was a fishy horseplay from a red-headed beauty, past a black-bearded sailor to a neck-and-neck finish over a wandering seahorse worth 50,000 bucks. And I was the jockey. It happened like this. From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of crime fiction, comes his most famous character in... The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. Now, with Gerald Moore, starred as Philip Marlowe, we bring you tonight's exciting story, The Seahorse Jockey. You know, Mr. Marlowe, when you came in today, I said to myself, I said, it's a funny thing. You've been getting your hair cuts here now for six, seven years. But but I never found out how you vote, Republican or Democrat. Well, I like to think that's my business. And, and, and another, another thing, never did you tell me if you're for the Marshall Plan or against the Marshall Plan. Well, the Marshall Plan... And, and, and for the California's governor next fall... Well, there's no doubt in my yeah. mind. And, and the income tax... Uh, sit back, please. Yeah, yeah. Oh. Now, now, the income tax is fair or it's not fair? Well, eminently... Now, now, how, how, come, how come all this stuff, I don't know what is your opinion? I can't imagine. Uh, of course, my opinion, I tell people. I say political party is a matter of getting to... Oh, excuse me. Saved by the bell. Hello? Uh, Alvin's Barbershop. Uh, Alvin speaking. Who? Mr. Marlowe? Yes, he's right here. Uh, hold on, please. It's for you, Mr. Marlowe. Always interruption, ain't it? You're so right. For 60, well, never mind. Thank you. Hello? Mr. Marlowe, this is Mrs. Lola Demarest speaking. Oh? Thank goodness I've finally located you. Now, you're to come out to my place at once. Pacific Palisades, 1312 Old Tower Road, and your plane leaves in two Why, hours. Uh, now, but wait a minute. What plane, there, Mrs. Demarest? Why? What's this all about? The seahorse. I'm going to sell it, Mr. Marlowe. My mind's made up. The sea witch? A seahorse. Mr. Marlowe, it's a brooch six inches high and set with precious stones, which a San Francisco dealer is anxious to pay $5,000 for. Well, look, Mrs. Demarest, I... The dealer's flying to New York tomorrow, Mr. Marlowe, and also my doctors say I'm living by sheer willpower alone. Hence, my decisions must be made quickly. Now, the terms of the deal are cash, so please be sure that you're armed. And the money will be returned here to my stepdaughter, Jillian Demarest, unfortunately. Oh, you don't approve, huh? No, no. However, I'll abide by my late husband's wishes. Jillian is to be provided for. Now, no more questions, sir. Just hurry. You'll be paid handsomely. And when you get here, Mr. Marlowe, use the back porch. I'll be in my bedroom. The other doors are locked. You're alone, Mrs. Demarest? No servants? I'm merely sick, Mr. Marlowe, not dead. And oh. since I've just fired Elmer Paris, who was called a lawyer, but it was actually more of a baboon, we'll be able to talk now. Hurry, Mr. Marlowe. Please be punctual. My new lawyer is due here at 4.30. I'll finish up and be ready for you at exactly 5. Is that clear? I've got one question. Were you ever a barber? Goodbye, sir. Now, Alvin, it looks like we'll have to skip that shave. Oh, uh, that's, that's too bad, Mr. Marlowe. Uh, like I said, I'm anxious to get your opinions. Opinions are important, huh? Important, oh, you know. Oh, sure, Al, sure. Yeah, and, I, I mean, the way I look at it, Mr. Marlowe... Alvin! <clears throat> yes, Mr. Marlowe? Wipe the lather off. Your chin, not mine. Pacific Palisades and my new client's home at 1312 Old Town Road was 40 minutes from L.A. The house was Victorian-style solid made of wood two stories high and squatted close to the edge of a sun-baked cliff 200 feet above the ocean. I parked behind what must have been the first Pierce Arrow ever made and started slowly along a gravel path that led to the rear until I heard it. Inside, I found an old woman whom I figured to be my client leaning against a half-open kitchen door, sobbing and clenching at the gingham apron she wore like it would keep her from screaming again. Mrs. Demarest, get hold of yourself. What happened? I'm not Mrs. Demarest. Oh, the poor darling. Her heart. She's dead. She's dead. In there... The bedroom. Oh. But who are you? My name's Philip Marlowe. Mrs. Demarest hired me an hour ago. An hour ago. She was a handsome woman. A beautiful woman and a good woman. You, you're the detective, aren't you, about the brooch? Yeah. 
How'd this happen, Mrs... Uh, Lockfield. Oh. Miss Bertie Lockfield. Miss Lockfield, were you with her? No, I came over a bit ago. I'm Lola's best friend, you know, her only friend. I came over in my car to cook her some dinner, like I do all the time. I live right by the little cottage at the foot of Old Tower Road, the one with the tall the hedges. The dinner, Miss Lockfield, you were saying? Oh, yes. Well, Mr. Marlowe, can we go back to the living oh, room? Oh, sure, sure. Now, uh, Miss Lockfield, you came over to cook dinner, then what? Well, I looked in on her first, like I do all the time. And since she was asleep, I went to the kitchen and set things going. And then? Oh, here, you better sit down, huh? Thank you. Then I went back to my place, fussed around for ten, maybe twenty minutes. Then I came here again and found what we just saw. That pillow clenched in one hand like she'd wanted all to right, hold All right, all right, take something. it easy, Miss Lockfield. Try to hold on, huh? Now, tell me. You didn't happen to see anything of the new lawyer around, did you? New lawyer? Why, why Lola didn't mention a new lawyer. Uh, he was due here today? Yeah, a half hour ago. Might help if we knew his name. Why, Mr. Marlowe? Mr. Marlowe? Surely you don't think there was, well, foul play? I don't know, Miss Lockfield. But for one thing, the position of the pillow seems kind of cockeyed to me. Yes, but who on earth would want to... Oh, no, not Jillian. It couldn't be. Mrs. Demarest was quite clear about Jillian. Jillian oh, hated Lola, Mr. Marlowe, but Jillian isn't a, a killer. Yeah, well, maybe nobody's been killed. But tell me, Miss Lockfield, did this stepdaughter, this uh, Jillian, know that she was getting the money from the brooch? Oh, no, I doubt it very much. Although she did know that Lola had it, of course, and... And what? And that Lola's money was dwindling, Mr. Marlowe, and that she was selling her possessions one by one. Uh-huh. And therefore, Jillian might think that the seahorse brooch was hers by right of inheritance, huh? Yes. Yeah. Tell me, Miss Lockfield, do you know where Mrs. Demarest kept the brooch? Oh, yes, in the bedroom. I'll show you exactly where. Come. All right. It's behind the portrait of Mr. Demarest and... Oh, the poor, poor Oh, come darling. on, take it easy, honey, huh? Did you say behind a portrait, that one? Yes. There's a panel in the wall that slides. Uh-huh. Move the picture to your right, Mr. Marlowe. Then pull out on the panel edging. You'd better use the chair. Yeah. <clears throat> to the right. And out on the panel edging, huh? That's it. That's it. See it? This velvet case? No, no, those are earrings. The brooch is much bigger. It's in a silk bag, Mr. Marlowe. Mr. Marlowe, don't you see it? No, and I don't think I will. Miss Lockfield, the velvet case is all there is. The seahorse is gone. I called the law and reported both the theft of the brooch and the death of Mrs. Demarest while Bertie Lockfield prompted over my shoulder. After that, I started through the place looking for anything that could possibly give me a lead on the wandering seahorse. Fifteen minutes later, all I could show for my effort was a telephone number, Surfside 10229. It meant nothing to me except that it was written on a sheet of brown roll-your-own cigarette paper. When I dialed the number and got no answer, I dropped the paper into my pocket. I told Miss Lockfield to wait for the police and headed for town in the first public phone booth. I started through the local classified directory looking for a lawyer named Elma Paris. When I didn't find him, I figured he could be somebody's junior partner. So I began at the top. I scored on my seventh nickel. Calder, Kramer, and McDuff. It was the anchor man who answered. Elma Paris? Yes, we employ a lawyer by that name. One who was fired by Mrs. Lola Demarest early today, Mr. McDuff? who ceased working for Mrs. Lola Demarest early today. All right, objection sustained. Tell me, where can I get in touch with Mr. Paris? At his desk here in the office, where he's been all day. Your reason for asking, sir? The answer you just gave me. Now, one last item, Mr. McDuff. Did your firm supply a new lawyer for Mrs. Demarest late today? We did not. And, sir, we never will. Oh? Each lawyer in this office is, first a gentleman, second a competent barrister. The belligerent Mrs. Demarest has use for neither. Good day, sir. <laughs> with that, I checked Elma Paris off my list and went back to the phone book. Jillian Demarest, my late client's stepdaughter, was listed at number 111, Los Amigos Terrace, which a map on the back of the book showed to be just off Sunset Boulevard in Hollywood. Come in. The girl herself, replete with old fashion, the only thing that was, was redheaded. Maybe 30. 
and meat and potato curves in either direction. From a waistline that was strictly rye crisp over lettuce leaves. Sit down. What's your problem? Well, I uh, got some bad news, Miss Demarest. Don't tell me. It's my income tax. I've been caught lying. It's your stepmother. She's dead, Jill. Oh. That's too bad. Her yeah, heart? well, try not to go to pieces, kid, huh? Look, I didn't particularly like Lola Demris. She didn't particularly like me. So, why make a thing of it? Because the seahorse brooch has been stolen. You're kidding. Don't try brushing that off, because it was supposed to be sold today with the proceeds to go to you. To... You're a liar. Uh-uh, private detective. Hired Jill to fly the brooch to a San Francisco dealer, and I found out it's really worth $50,000. A lot of dough you didn't expect. Okay, Mr. Private Detective. That last crack. It means exactly what? That you could have taken the brooch yourself. Try me again. Surfside, 10229. Stop pushing and start listening. If Lola intended to sell the brooch and give me the money, it was for one reason only. My father wanted it that way. So? So. So do I. And now that you're without a client, maybe you'll work for me. I doubt it. I write and get paid well. 5,000 words a month for a pulp magazine. Torrid stories. It figures. Pays off nicely. Be worth your while. Do you want to help me? Suppose you're lying and actually stole the brooch yourself. What then? <laughs> then you handcuff me to the nearest cop and run for mayor on the Let's Clean Up Local Crime ticket. Now, is it a deal for, say, um, 1% of the 50,000, if I get it? Zero if I don't. 500 of fun, huh? Mm-hmm. Ah, okay, Jill, it's a deal. Good. Mm, and for a starter, do you happen to know who Mrs. Demarest's new lawyer was? New lawyer? I didn't know the old one had been fired. I didn't say he had. Could have quit, you know. Nobody ever quit working for Lola Demarest. It wasn't her nature. No? No. Will you please stop barking at me and go out and bite the guy with the brooch? You uh, look like you could do a good job of it. For 500 bucks. Yeah. But just think of the opposition, Jill. It's snapping at 50 grand. I drove back to the foot of Old Tower Road in the smothered Ivy cottage labeled Miss Bertie Lockfield. I started for the front door, but only got halfway. That'll do nicely. <laughs> right where you are. Oh, fine. You're a friend of Bertie Lockfield's or a relative, which... A nephew, why? Because nephew... Aunt Bertie's not home, and I want someone responsible to leave a message with. So you go looking for him with a gun, huh? Now listen, baby, Shut up I... and try to remember this. Tell your aunt that the new lawyer Mrs. Demarest hired will be in touch with her. Does that make any sense to you? No. But maybe if I knew his name, it would. <laughs> I doubt it. Now, nephew, without any fuss, let me have your car. Hey, now, wait a minute. Wait... Come on. You'll find your car a block away from here where I left mine. Give. No. Happy motoring. Thank you, nephew. And don't forget the message. She backed away, got into my car, and started it without once taking her dead, fish-cold gray eyes off me. When she jerked away from the curb, it was too late for me to do anything but swear and start walking to my car. It was where she said it would be, so I got in and sulked as far as the first public telephone. It was time to try Surfside 10229 again. Hello, I'd like to, uh, I'd like to talk to... To who? Wait a minute, is that you, Lieutenant Matthews? Yeah. Marlowe? Yeah, that's right. Oh, that Demarest case, huh? Well, Phil, the coroner thinks it was murder, all right. Suffocated her with a pillow, but they won't be sure till the autopsy report is in. Yeah, wait a minute, Matthews, hey, wait a minute, will you? You're at Surfside 10229, right? Yeah. You got this number from Homicide, didn't you? No, I didn't. I got it from a brown cigarette paper I found at Mrs. Demarest's. Huh? Now, look, tell me, Matthews, what have you got and where are you? 51 South Monroe Place. 51 it's South It's a dead one, Phil, a guy who sported a beard. The name was Paul Crater. Oh, occupation lawyer, right? No, Phil, wrong. The occupation was able-bodied seaman. In just a moment, the second act of Philip Marlowe. But first... Dr. Christian's latest patient comes up with a new problem for the kindly small-town physician this Wednesday, and it's the case of a man who's about to be evicted from the place to which he's come home to die. 
Add to this, the patient is an exceedingly lively, rip-roaring centurion, and you have the makings of a highly dramatic, amusing yarn. Dr. Christian, starring Gene Herschel, is heard every Wednesday on most of these same CBS stations. Now with our star, Gerald Moore, the second act of Philip Marlowe, and tonight's story, The Seahorse Jockey. I was 30 minutes getting out to the address Matthews had given me. The neighborhood around Surfside looked like it had been pushed together from scraps that had washed in from the sea. And number 51 Monroe Place was no improvement. It was a corroded little frame house surrounded by a picket fence with most of its front teeth missing. I parked in the red glare from the squad car's spotlight, and as I walked past the sagging gate, I could hear Matthews inside. Oh, hello, Marlo. Come on in. But don't fall over the late Mr. Paul Crater there. Oh, that's him, huh? Doesn't look much like a sailor to me, Matthews, in spite of his whiskers. What do you expect, bell-bottom trousers? All right, all right. Those guys wear suits when they're short like anyone else. He was shot twice, Phil. Once in the stomach, once in the chest. Drop right here in front of the door, huh? Yeah. The way it looked, somebody came up and knocked, and when Crater opened the door, they let him have it. Got a line on him? Well, he was a nice, quiet guy, apparently. Uh Lived here with his sister, Helen. As far as we know, they got along fine. We're still trying to locate her. He worked around here someplace, but we don't know where yet. But what about that Demarest business? Oh, that. Well, I... Oh, wait a minute. Oh, okay. Matthews. Yeah, Mooney. I see. Jug Nolan. As in J-U-G? Yeah. Uh-huh. He is? No, uh, you come on back. I'll check him later, personally. Well, Phil, that answers one question anyway. Crater here worked out of a boatyard on Front Street. Now, what was that Nolan, J-U-G, about? Jug Nolan. He's the bird who runs the shipyard. Oh. Mooney says he's a genuine old sea dog from Roll Your Owns to... Wait a tettle... minute. Did you say Roll Your Owns? Yeah. Matthews, how about letting me talk to this Nolan before you and the boys move in? Why? I'd like to check the color of his cigarette papers, and I'll let you know. Well, okay, Marlo. Only keep your chin in. Maybe Nolan doesn't know anything about what happened to Crater here. Unless he pulled the trigger, huh? I drove through the thick smell of seaweed and dead fish that was front straight for ten blocks before I found a battered sign that read Nolan's dangled over the door to a shanty of an office behind which a tangle of crooked masts stuck up like jack straws out of a jam of crusty hulks I pulled into the curb across the street from the place and started to get out when the office door opened and a man who looked something left over from Moby Dick stepped out, headed across in my direction. As he passed in front of my car, I got a good look at the butt of the homemade cigarette, drooping over a jaw as heavy as the end of an anchor. It was rolled with brown paper. Odds on, it had to be Jug Nolan. When he swung on down the street and finally went into a bar, I followed. Ah, hey, sweet! Do it again, huh? Be right with you, Chuck. Well, snap to it. I gotta get... Well, what do you make of it, mate? Something biting you? Not exactly, Jug. I was just wondering how well you're acquainted with Lola Demarest. Demarest? Yeah. Well enough to know she's got vinegar in her veins instead of blood. Why? Is the old crackpot something to you? No, not now. She was my client earlier tonight. I'm a private detective. Name's Marlowe. Now keep it. You were up to see her today. I'd like to know why. Go ask her. That's a little tough now. She's dead. Yeah? Well, better late than never, mate. Miss her, do you? I can stand the strain. What was your business with her? Boats. Sure it wasn't seahorses? Don't talk bills to me, mate. I said boats. Two rusty, rotten scows covered with barnacles enough to sink them in another week. But to hear that old gal talk, you think each one was the Queen Mary. Hey, Swede! Yeah? Pour me that drink. Okay, okay, Jug. Here. Here you are. What's yours, mister? Scotch, Johnny Walker. Take them both out of this. No, you don't. I'll buy my own. And I'm tired of your questions, mate, so haul out. Here, sweet. Suit yourself. Maybe you can bear up on one more question, Nolan. For you, maybe it's easy. Who killed Paul Crater? What was that? Somebody put two bullets in Paul Crater in front door of his house. I just came from there. Paul, dead. If you're lying to me, mate, I'll tear you in two. Get your hands off, Jug. Why would I lie? Do the cops know who did it? Not yet, but they will. I'll find out about this and in a hurry. Slow down, Nolan. There's no rush. Crater's going to be dead a long time. I want to ask Get you... Get out something. of my way! Now look, Nolan, I said I wanted to... Never mind. Okay, Commodore, help yourself. 
Nolan's ponderous right fist was cocked when I changed my mind, but that wasn't what did it. Over his shoulder, I'd spotted a familiar face. Detective Lieutenant Matthews leaning at the end of the bar and studying his thumbnail intently. As Jug stamped past him and out the door, Matthews jerked the intriguing thumb at a thin, sandy man working a pinball machine, who suddenly lost all interest in the game and left abruptly. And Matthews sidled down the bar toward me. Sorry to step on your heels there, Phil, but we found out that Nolan has two judgments against him for assault. Got a very dangerous temper, it seems. Well, you saved me a split lip. Did you hear all of it? Enough to convince me that Jug Nolan didn't do it, but we'll tag him just to play safe. Oh. Chances are he's heading for Crater's house now, which should just give me a good chance to go to his place and look around. Uh-huh. I'll see you, Marla. Yeah, so long, Matthew. Something else for you, mister? No, thanks, Swede. Unless you can tell me why so many surfside sailors grow Van Dykes. Ha, I wondered myself. Maybe it's to hide those dirty collars. I don't know. Hey, <laughs> Sweet. Couldn't stand the city gas. Hey, here's one with a beaver now, mister. Why don't you ask him? Oh, it's not that come important. On, come on, let's go, Sweet. Set me up some rye okay, whiskey. Okay, and... all right. Say, Tusik, this fella here wants to know why you sailors grow those chin whiskers. <laughs> yeah? Hey, Skipper, I'll tell you. A sailor's got to have something to do while he's away his spare time at sea that uh, don't take up too much space. Yeah, well, I guess it beats bike racing. I'll see you, <laughs> Dusik. Uh, hey, wait, I want to tell you. I went to town today looking for nothing but a change of scene in a chubby blondie shirt with, see? And what happens? Yeah, well, that's fine. Some gal I... takes a look at my bed and thinks I'm a college professor doing research. I couldn't throw her out with a blowtorch. Yes, so well, I... The next one runs for her life because she takes me for a judge. And after a that, judge. I'm just getting around hey, to Hey, wait a minute. Hold it, hold it, Dusik. Huh? You say judge? What's up, Skipper? Are you losing your rudder? Just the opposite. You've given me an idea that'll work. Yeah, and what? Two murders, a beautiful sneer, and a missing seahorse. Uh, it's wild, but it's beginning to make some sense. So long, sailor. I checked Nolan's boatyard first, but his upper shack was dark. So I drove hard back to 51 Monroe Place in the hope that Matthews had been right about Jug's destination. When I ground to a stop, I once again gave thanks for smart cops. Jug Nolan was there, all the fight gone out of him as he stared without seeing it at the blood spot on the floor where Paul Crater had died. I asked him one simple question. The answer he grunted in three words without so much as looking up. But it made everything fit. And as I got to the phone, I knew that whatever else he was, the old sea dog was no liar. It's Marlowe, Jill. Oh, I've been waiting for this. What is it? Money or fun? All depends. Now listen close. I've got to have some help right away. What's wrong? Where are you, Phil? It doesn't matter, but this does. Get hold of that friend of your stepmother's. What's her name? Uh, Bertie Lockfield. And both of you meet me at your stepmother's house as soon as you can make it. It's important, baby. Don't fail me. I understand you wanted our help in a big hurry. We rushed madly over I'm here. I'm sorry it took longer to get here than I figured. What do you want us to do, Phil? Catch a thief and a killer? You see, I'm positive now that whoever got away with that jeweled seahorse also held that pillar over Mrs. Demerer's face until she died and went on to kill Paul Crater in Surfside. What? Two murders? Killers have that advantage, baby. For one murder or a dozen, the price is the same. Well, I don't understand, Marlowe. Does the second murder have something to do with my stepmother's death? They follow like links in a chain, Jill. Lola Demarest called me at 4. She was expecting a new lorry at 4.30. When I got here at 5, she was dead and the jewel seahorse was gone. However, the circumstances indicated that somebody who knew her had done the work. Then you don't think the new lawyer was the no, one No, who... but I do think the new lawyer came in, just as I did later through the open back door. Stood right over there and overheard the entire business. Can you prove all this, Marlowe? Not yet. But if you found that new lawyer, you could. Right. That new lawyer is going to turn up soon, and when she does, we'll have something she? more. Yeah, she, she, Bertie. Lola Demarest's new lawyer is a woman. A woman? The distinguished man in suit and Van Dyke that you shot and killed in Surfside was the lady lawyer's brother, a seaman. You mean Bertie here? Yeah, Jill. The new lawyer who witnessed the whole thing decided to move in on it. Right, Bertie? But it was blackmail. I got a note in my mailbox from a lawyer named Crater accusing me and demanding money. And since you were already in so deep, you figured another murder wouldn't matter. You got the lawyer's surfside address some way and went there. And that's why you stumbled, Bertie, over a suit of clothes and a beard. Bertie? Well, you were Lola's best friend. You'll never understand, you fool. So don't try. Bertie! Don't you try either, Marlo. Make a move for your gun and I'll put a bullet in her back. Marlo! Lola Demarest's best friend. <laughs> I despised and hated her. 
The years I worked and slaved for that woman, pampering her, putting up with her sickness, and her temper and her high-handed ways. She owed me plenty for those years. When it came time to pay, the money went to you, you cheap little snip. You'd done nothing for her. You were getting everything. Stand still, Marlowe. I came prepared, remember? So did I, Mrs. Zoffy. Helen Crater. Better drop it, Bertie. You're in the middle. Listen, we can still do business like you said in the note. Not now, sister. You forget three things. First, you tried to kill me. Second, you did kill my brother. Helen, you don't know what you're doing. And third, the female of the species is always deadlier than the male. <laughs> Matthews, that's about it. Yeah. What do you think will happen to Helen Crater? Uh, that's one I don't have to figure out. Uh, well, she's a lawyer, you know. Say, Maybe by the she way, could... Phil, huh? how did you find out she was the lawyer? Oh, that. Well, you see, the fact that the new lawyer was nowhere around bothered me. Uh-huh. And then when I was in that bar in Surfside, one sailor with a beard told me he'd been mistaken for a judge. <laughs> So I figured maybe another sailor also with a beard could have been mistaken for a lawyer. So. And uh, you work back from that. Yeah. To Paul Crater's sister, Helen. I finally asked Nolan what Helen Crater did for a living. He told me. You see, he was the guy who had recommended Helen in the first place. He'd come to see Lola about the boats uh -huh. and found out that she needed a lawyer, right? That's right. So he tossed some business to Paul Crater's sister. Uh, That's how the phone number came on brown cigarette paper. Though You know, I found it on the sun porch. Well, that's it. Yeah. Well, you gonna get some coffee? No, no, thanks, Matthews. Okay, tired. No, oh, I think I'll go home. It's almost three in the morning. Silent, sterile hour at the short end of a long, long night. Everything that happened had been because of a jeweled seahorse. An ugly little replica of an ugly little fish. But then, as I thought about it, I realized that the trouble wasn't because of the seahorse. It was because of the people. Bertie Lockfield, Helen Crater, Lola Demarest. <laughs> That's always the trouble. People. Yeah, to coin a cliché, it takes all kinds of people to louse up the world. The Adventures of Philip Marlowe, bringing you Raymond Chandler's most famous character, star Gerald Moore are produced and written by Norman MacDonald and written for radio by Robert Mitchell and Gene Levitt. Featured in the cast were Stan Waxman, Ann Morrison, Ruth Parrott, Eileen Prince, Ed Begley, John Stevenson, and Bob Sweeney. The special music is composed and conducted by Richard Arant. Be sure and be with us again next week when Philip Marlowe says... This time all I had to go on was a postmark, but that was plenty. It led me to a knife between a pair of shoulders, a woman with a second-hand face, and a corpse by a water wheel. There'll be some grand singing on CBS this Wednesday night. Bing Crosby will play host to Al Jolson and Ella Fitzgerald, and Burns and Allen will entertain lovely Dinah Shore. Also, Groucho Marx will be around with more of his wonderful wit on his quiz, You Bet Your Life. And, of course, Dr. Christian will be on hand with another famous story. They'll all be heard on most of these same CBS stations, so be listening. This is Roy Rowan speaking. Now, stay tuned for Pursuit, which follows immediately over many of these same CBS stations. This is CBS, where Wednesday night is Bing Crosby night, the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>